Welcome to Native Yoga Toddcast. So happy you are here. My goal with this channel is to bring inspirational speakers to the mic in the field of yoga, massage, body work, and beyond. Follow us at Native Yoga and check us out at nativeyogacenter.com. All right, let's begin. Thanks for tuning in. Real quick, Native Yoga Center is located in beautiful Juneau Beach, Florida, and online, wherever you are. Join me for practice. Click the free live stream link in the show notes and get your practice growing. I am so excited to have the opportunity to join in conversation with Eric Shaw today. Please find him on his website, prasanayoga.com, P-R-A-S-A-N-A-Y-O-G-A.com. You can click the link in the description to easily access his work. He is the author of a book called BKS Iyengar and the Making of Modern Yoga. And he has also just released a new book called Sacred Thread, a comprehensive yoga timeline, 2,000 events that shaped yoga history. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Eric. And I'm so happy to have this chance to speak with you. I love yoga philosophy and you've done a lot of study. And on that note, can you fill me and the listener in on, uh, are you, have you gotten your doctorate in in yoga studies no i um i've done a lot of that a lot of academic work i started a doctoral program in 2004 uh, finished my studies in 2011 um pretty much got the knowledge base that i desired at that time and was able to parlay that into uh successful work in the yoga world but um to my dismay and to my <laughs> my sense of existential loss i might even go as far as to say i uh i did not get my phd um you speak to me in a time where my life is opening up in a new way and i'm actually applying to a phd program again um wow not for practical purposes it's kind of like it's i feel like uh, it's something i want to do for the sort of like a, a life aim you know like climbing mount Everest. yes um but yeah i didn't get it done at that point in my life um, and I could talk all day about that, why it didn't happen, but, um, I did get a master's degree out of it and that, and I got a knowledge base that was, that was quite useful for me for writing work and lecturing work in the yoga world. Nice. Well, when you, you had to write a thesis for your master's, I'm guessing. Um, yes. What, yes. what I, did you base that on? Um, I based it on the likes of BKS Iyengar. Um, I did a very deep study of him, um, partly because his followers were so prominent in the Bay Area where I was working in San Francisco, Mm. Um, and because that um, system, according to my training, was so alien to me and so confrontive. Um, It's, as everyone knows who studied it, it's arguably the most comprehensive yoga system out there. you know, if, unless he went went to some ancient system, perhaps as far as the modern systems goes, its complexity, its philosophy, its uh, understanding of the body and the way that um, st- it's set up structurally, the function and function in yoga is very clear and vastly articulated. So, and the people who teach it have a pedagog- pedagog- pedagogical style, a teaching style, which is strangely aggressive, <laughs> I might say. <laughs> and all those things were quite confronted to me when I arrived in the Bay Area in 2004 after training in Kripalu yoga and other forms of yoga, which were much more mm. meditative, much more, I thought, holistic, based in pranayama, based, based in spiritual aims. Here I was, I was faced with this very physical culturalist yoga, which some people from that tradition might argue with me as characterizing it that way. But to me, it was so body centric and so awesome centric, and that 
and I think it's that's kind of strange to say in the year 2022 because yoga has become mm. more and more and more and more and more asana centric. I mean, it's been a process that's been happening for hundreds of years, but yeah. it seems like it's only been accelerated as it's come into the American context. But for me, that was difficult, and part of my working that out was to write this um, this kind of mono monofocal paper on Iyengar. Wow. Did you, well, actually let me back up so I can get a timeline of your history of practice. When did you start practicing yoga? What was your first introduction to the yoga world? It's, it's kind of an un- funny story given my history. I, uh, my parents were ministers and they, they were very, very open-minded liberal ministers. I come from the West Coast, so it's very much different from the South where I'm living now. Um, and so, <laughs> Sorry. It, yeah, good point, right? Good p- yeah, yeah. If you talk about Christianity in, in this part of the world, um, but where I came from, you know, they were liberals, they were, you know, anti war protesters, they were raging leftists. So, I did get a political orientation in my Christian experience, but it wasn't a right wing one, it was a radical left wing one. Mm. So, that was my background. Um, and so a, there was a certain openness there to intellectuality at, at all its levels. So when I, you know, told my parents I was an atheist, they didn't bat an eye. <laughs> when I told my parents that I was into Eastern traditions and studying, you know, um, Buddhism and meditation, they didn't bat an eye. You know, so um, that became my practice very early on in my early twenties, and uh, very much a life-saving practice because my mind was kind of out of control. As, and it may still sound that way, <laughs> but um, meditation helped me control my life. Um, and I dived right into it and main, have maintained that practice to this very day. Nice. So I, I did some early investigation into Buddhist traditions, and it wasn't until the early 90s that I joined Siddha Yoga, which is a Hindu tradition. I actually did that in the midst of the time I was studying Christianity and a religious studies degree in Minneapolis, Minnesota. But that kind of open the Hindu world to me a little bit. And then when I started practicing Hatha yoga in 2000, um, then I started to investigate Hinduism more properly and understand how different it was from the Buddhist tradition, how much richer, how much more embracing of the human experience in all of its aspects and even culture in all of its aspects. And so it was incredibly compelling to me given my background and um, I pretty much, you know, it became a gestalt experience for me. I just dived right into it. Wow. You made mention of the appreciation for the Iyengar tradition and Iyengar's guru being Krishna Maracharya. Did you investigate and or practice with any other teachers under that lineage? Yeah, um, Actually, quite a few. I mean, the Bay Area, as I said, was a hotbed of strong Iyengar teachers. So it was easy to um, study with strong teachers who not only came to town to teach, but who were residents there. So my chief preceptor in the practice, Tony Briggs, um, and he had a relationship to Shanda Remite, who was my primary teacher, a teacher I'd met actually when I was still in Portland, Oregon, before 2004. And started studying with Matt Hush at the time, who was a primary follower of Shandor. And Shandor, it's strange to talk about Shandor in the Iyengar context, because few people even know that he studied with Iyengar. He actually mm. stayed with him for 20 years, mm. an extremely long time. And he was actually the president of the Iyengar Yoga Federation in Australia. But he made a jump to the embrace of martial arts and uh, Bharatanatyam yoga, um, or rather Indian dance. And he integrated... Uh, ancient practices that he claimed to have learned at the Chidambaram Temple in India into a new form that he called Shadow Yoga. Um, He's continued to evolve his forms and change the names of them, but I learned from him and his teaching was profound and very vinyasa-based, very movement-based, but he was an Iyengar teacher. And then Tony, Tony had worked with Shandor, so that was my connection with Tony, but Tony was a classic Iyengar teacher. I mean, he mm. was going to put you in a pose and hold you there and break it down into all its constituent parts and which muscles are engaged and released and yada, yada, yada. Mm. So that training and with other Ramanan Patel and other big names in the Bay Area helped me 
to understand asana from the alignment perspective, which I feel is is very, very important. I mean, yeah, it's at so many levels. But then I also worked with Paul Grilly, who was into kind of destroying the whole yeah. alignment concept. <laughs> um, so I, I got a lot of a lot of input around yoga philosophy and yoga practice um, you... in those years that were invaluable. Nice. Just the basing, uh, to touch upon what you just mentioned, I've enjoyed watching Paul Greeley's work around anatomy and say yin yoga. Can you explain how Paul Greeley's philosophy does uh, shatter that existing idea of alignment that you were studying? Can you give me what, what tell me what that means or what that sounds like? Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's a good story, I think, for anybody who wants to be a serious practitioner of yoga. I think it's important to understand alignment principles, particularly from the anger perspective, but it's also very important to understand their limits. And Paul has done the spade work. He's done the deep work in defining those limits. Um, and it's, I'm just shocked that so few people know his work because it's, it's utterly revolutionary, even if you don't have Iyengar as a conversation partner for it. Mm. Um, so Paul really He's, you know, he's ostensibly known for his work in yin yoga, and that's how I first understood him and met him. Um, yin yoga was my, actually my teaching practice early on because he was one of the first major teachers I met in Portland, Oregon. I wrote a small profile for him for a local yoga magazine, and we got to be friends. And then he, I, when he started working with uh, uh, you know, Pranamai, Pranavayu, I forget the... Pranamaya, Pranamaya, I think that's it. It's a with an early video company making, you know, when yoga, you know, when DVD still exists. Yes, a group yeah. of people there in um, San Francisco who I met, was hanging out with, and then Paul was a part of that group, and he came down to do um, yoga videos there. And so he, re when I was there in San Francisco, he recorded his um, yoga anatomy um, DVD, which in which he distills all of his knowledge around bony limits in the body. So mm. it's the skeletal structure of the body, which determines which poses you can get in and which you can't. And that's, I know that's a very black and white statement, but it's actually quite true. The, the soft tissue, of course, creates limits that we can push through in the attempt to attain any given asana. And that's what Iyengar practice is based on limitlessly. And that's the error limitlessly. Mm. What, what uh, really determined and demonstrated directly in that DVD by comparing different human bodies that the length of your bones, the orientation of the bones in a given joint, the way it spirals out of that joint, the way it engages with the next joint in the chain determines whether or not any given pose is even available to you. Mm. And that's for a yoga teacher who's attempting to guide students of different shapes and sizes into the poses, that, that knowledge is absolutely critical, um, particularly if you've been trained in Iyengar yoga, because it does not integrate that knowledge. In mm. fact, it's it's uh, kind of philosophically opposed to it. Yeah, interesting. Because of the idea that, say, there is a limitless potential, therefore we're going to ignore a bone-on-bone -bone contact and still assume that I can just keep going deeper and deeper and deeper until infinity. Is that, is that how you see the basis of the Iyengar philosophy? Yeah, it's not only that, but it's also the idea, and I don't know if this is still current. I mean, as I preface, you know, I've been out of the yoga world for about five years. So I'm here in Dallas in kind of a small little bubble of yoga practice, and I'm not really tracking what's been going on as yep. carefully as I used to, where I used to be, have my fingers everywhere. Yep. Um, but, um, you know, that what was held as a kind of central tenet of Iyengar yoga was that, and, I, and I'm saying this because I don't know if it's still current in Iyengar circles or even anywhere anymore, is that if you couldn't do a yoga pose, it was because you had a psychic block. Mm. It wasn't a physiological challenge. It was a psychic challenge. Wow. And... So it was an ethical challenge. It was like, in a way, the implication was there is that you're a bad person if you can't do, you know, pinch of my asana. <laughs> you know, it's, 
it, 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 it definitely there's a progression of practice in terms of putting effort and learning. But if there is a stuckness, a kind of block, that's because your karma is in the way. Mm. Great point. And so have you yeah. practiced with Patabi Joyce? Yeah, he came to San Francisco and I was able to study with him for about a week, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I kind of touched the master then. That was nice. And in respect to that, there when I had a chance to go to Mysore and practice with him, I, I came in contact with what you're talking about, about, um, you know, hitting a point of feeling like, okay, this is about as far as I could, or maybe should go for healthy boundaries that then, um, <clears throat> you know, it's a psychic block or you're holding yeah. on to some baggage and or some karma from a previous life or something of that sort that's causing you to not be able to go further. So then with that being said, that there obviously is a similarity within the Ashtanga world and the Iyengar, your world, Iyengar yoga world. Do you feel like with their guru that it must have stemmed from that tradition and Krishnamaracharya's teachings? That's actually a good guess. I mean, I, I've never seen it in black and white. I've never yeah. seen it in any of Macharya's writings or quotes from him, yeah. but um, maybe it's an idea that floats around in the Indian tradition um, or it's something that comes, it could be of, come directly from Krishna Macharya. Yeah. But that's a good guess. Do you, do you think that the work that Paul has done, Paul Greeley in relation to observing the limitations of say a bone on bone connection or at least the skeletal system as, and then studying each different body size and shape and bone length. And like what you mentioned in terms of, you know, everyone's got this different unique set of skeletal structure that there, that's almost like a more secularization uh, process that could have come out of I guess if I backtrack a little bit, if I read, say, Paramahansa Yogananda's book, Autobiography of a Yogi, and you read about these really fantastic things that yogis were doing or can do in India mm -hmm. that can yeah. um, defy physics, you know, defy yeah. our modern understanding of physics, that, yeah. that maybe in India in the old days there was a – either they had the ability to defy physics or – they use the idea of the ability to defy physics to build up to guru status that yeah. was really, do you think really hacking in on like, wait, 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 you know, was that stuff true or real and what is possible? Yeah. What are your thoughts regarding that? Yeah. And that's a fascinating interface, right? It's the subjective experience of the body and the, in a sense, subjective power mm. over the world. I mean, and I know that's kind of a strange phrase, but we, if we believe in miracles, if we believe that, and I don't think actually miracles are even miracles. I don't think that the metaphysical world, we're kind of backtracking a bit here, but I don't think the metaphysical world is, is meta. I think there is a more subtle energy that vibrates within life forms that has not yet been measured. I think it will be measured. It will be utilized as fully as electromagnetism is now, mm. all the forms of electromagnetism, you know, electricity, light, and microwaves, and et cetera, et cetera. But we just haven't scaled it back to that kind of increment in the spectrum. Um, and that at, that, at that level in the spectrum, it is manipulated by will and intention. And if you look at the world in this, from this point of view, it all makes sense. <laughs> it's, there is no metaphysics. There is no spirituality. There is no miracle. Everything is either a manipulation of gross matter or subtle matter. Mm. And in, of course, in the Indian tradition, the stock and trade is to invest in the subtle control, the subjective control of life force to, to move behind gross reality, behind the empirical reality, behind what we've measured in Western science, because it is arguably more powerful and, and things can be done from that vantage point, from that leverage point, we can even look at Jesus, that cannot be done from a grosser leverage point, and we might say a less informed leverage point, a more 
ignorant, blunter place. From the mm. deeper, more subtle place, you can control more things. Wow. And so that, that idea, because it's so prevalent in the Indian tradition, and frankly, from an objective point of view, because Indian bodies are thinner, they operate in a warm climate, they're less um, compounded by stress, um, they can do more of these flexible things, even from an objective standpoint, they aren't focused on a more empirical, physiological, Western, mm. you know, um, medical allopathic model of medicine yeah. that makes us look at what the bones can and cannot do. So they, it's never been integrated. Wow. That's fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Long way around. No, I like it. Thank you. I'm so, <laughs> wow. All right. Well, your book with the new title, 2000, sorry, let me make sure I get this right. I'm going to say just 2000 events. <laughs> Did you literally write out 2000 different events or how does that title um, work into the way that you've tried to structure your study and telling of uh, yoga history? <laughs> Thank you for that question. Yeah. You kind of free me to talk about how the book was formed and the form it takes, which I think is a very unique form. Um, I mean, if I can be so bold, I think there's no book like it in the yoga universe. Um, and it is a very comprehensive and well-researched history. And it's easy, it makes it very easy to consume because it's basically like 2,000 tweets. It's there, most of the entries are fairly short. There's, occasionally there's a longer entry, but it allows you to kind of just, you know, you know, you're like you're eating potato chips, one little event <laughs> after another. Um, nice. <laughs> and, and so it's consumable. It's quite consumable. But the book started when I started my uh, PhD program because I'm my kind of organized reality historically and culturally and, you know, the way that cultural culture morphs from form to form. I needed I see the world in terms of timelines very much. It's very much a way of, that I organize reality. I wanted to put it down on paper. So I, I started that way back in 2004. And as the years went on and I continued to expand it very late in the game, about two, three years ago, I realized I either had a dissertation on my hands or I had a popular book. Mm. And I kind of held out around the dissertation piece. I, I went to, I explored some bitter British system universities where you can just show up with a dissertation and get your PhD and thought, oh, I'll just, you know, I've already got the, the bedrock of this, the skeleton of this. I'll just write it out into a full yoga history and I'll present that to a British style university in Australia or England and, or, or UK and you're in there in the Commonwealth somewhere and get my PhD, make it easy on myself. But I just, that never happened. And I just thought, Eric, just make this a popular book, you know, publish it. Um, so that's what I did. I, I spent probably about nine months tripling or quadrupling the size of it until I got to over 200 pages and uh, researched all the topics that I hadn't focused on and, and left out, you know, things like yoga competitions or the, Ooh. or the biography of a certain yoga master um, some of the things we don't are not readily familiar with in our, you know, American Western context. Things, things that were going on in China, you know, where there's a huge yoga universe, most of us are not even aware about. Aware of. Um, I just tracked a lot of things that I hadn't tracked. You know, kept kind of filling the, you know, the argue, discussion with, between yoga and Christianity and yoga and Judaism. There's a lot of rich stuff there, stuff all over the map that I hadn't covered. So I, I expanded it and rewrote it, edited it, made the introduction to it clearer. Um, and until it was, it was a legitimate book and we were able to put it out there. So that's, that's how it attained its current form. Wow. That's amazing. What a, what a, pr a process you said since 2004 was kind of like the inception of, of you starting this, this pro this uh, book. Yeah. And, and at that point, it, at the point that it reached about 40 pages, I actually put it up on my website as a saleable item. So earlier forms of it are kind of out there. People bought it. Um, but yeah, yeah. So yeah, it, it, it's been a long time coming. <laughs> Almost 20 years in the making. That's amazing. Yeah. I can't yeah. wait to read it. I apologize. I have not read it prior to this conversation, but what yeah. I will do is read it 
and then um, yeah. come back with some more questions. But just in what you brought up, the first thing we said, yoga competitions, I definitely want to ask you some stuff about that. But what yeah. also really piqued my interest is yoga in China. That's something I yeah. haven't really thought about because, you know, obviously yoga has this, um, we, we want to give credit to India for being the birthplace of yoga. I, I would also, I'm curious if, if we track back further than that, would we need to say that yoga was born if we believe that the first humans are from Africa, but we would need to say that yoga really is the birthplace. Uh, India is the birthplace of yoga. Do you agree with that? No, well, that's also brings up a lot of interesting questions. Um, if we, how do we lend yoga? Do we lend yoga? Well, there's all kinds of legitimate ways to lend yoga. It is a cultural construct. It is a cultural construct that comes from the Indian tradition and can be sourced back thousands of years in the Indian tradition. We have texts, we have archaeological evidence, and we have the modern practices, which often retain um, unchanging states of um, what we call orthopraxis or, or, or um, orthodox forms of doing things. We see that in the text. The, the Indian tradition Actually, until recently, modernity has really touched it strongly and pushed it strongly. But it's been a very stable and evolving culture, but it's kept true to its cultural form. So yoga can be oriented in India. Yoga can be oriented as a world evolution, as a world practice that is evolving at a global mm. level. Mm. Um, and it, but it also can be um, lensed as kundalini science. And the minute you lends it as kundalini vidya, kundalini science, it becomes sort of what you suggested. It becomes merely something that is physiologically, physiologically encoded in the human form and therefore is timeless or it is as eternal as the human body. And therefore you could say, oh, there was yoga in Africa yeah. because yeah. this, as Stuart Savatsky frames it, the kundalini awakening process is a natural an inevitable process for the karmic experience of an individual through various lifetimes. And therefore it is like an inevitable puberty <laughs> that at some point, some of us or all of us will all experience if we keep returning and keep evolving. Um, so in that respect, yoga is truly timeless. Um, but uh, to, Steer back around to the specific question around yoga in China. The, the interesting thing about the powerful, powerful culture and ancient culture of India and the powerful, powerful and ancient culture of China, um, they have some basic differences in their orientation, but the most interesting thing to me is how divided they have remained because of their particular geographies. Mm. Um, the Himalayan mountain range and the jungles of Southeast Asia have really separated these two cultures so that they've been able to develop separately. And the dialogue with, that might naturally exist between two mass cultures that were so powerful um, and therefore expected to be in conversation and mutual influence have not happened anywhere near as much as we might suspect. Um, there's been very very, very much two different directions of evolution because of the geographical boundaries of those two countries. And, to, and in this day, because of the geopolitical boundaries, because they're, they're opposed to each other kind of um, uh, physio, you know, psychically to go back to that term. I mean, there's a, there's very much a different sense of life and what it, what it consists of in India as opposed to how it um, consists of life in China. So they don't blend as readily. I mean, I might even argue that American India blend better than India and China. Mm, interesting. But, but to steer back to my initial comment, that is not to say that because the modern world has valorized yoga and made it kind of the secular religion of a certain subset of our culture and a very powerful one, that that hasn't been taken up by China. It's been taken up by China radically. I mean, as you know, when I was working in Asia, um, there was 30,000 yoga studios in China back, you know, like seven years ago. I mean, I don't know what it is now, 
it's it's massive and they have sourced a lot of Indian teachers because they're close and because um, you can pay lower wages to Indian teachers and mm. China tends, you know, just tend to have a, a slower economy than ours, so it's definitely getting up to speed. So, um, and then because of the indigenous traditions of Tai Chi and Qigong and the easy overlap of those um, conceptual frameworks through human body and life force, there's been a lot of syncretic um, evolutes of yoga and the Chinese traditions that have become modernized. So, yeah, yoga is blooming madly <laughs> in China. Wow. Madly. Wow. On that note, then, what is your observation of yoga in American culture currently? I feel like you made mention at the time that you were able to practice in uh, West Coast, San Francisco, and you mentioned in um, uh, Seattle that, I mean, what, be, I live in Florida, so I've always looked at what was happening on the West Coast of America as like there were always a few years ahead. And in terms of yeah. yoga, for sure, yeah. like um, when I yeah. finally got a chance to live in San Diego, it was like I couldn't throw a rock and not hit a yoga studio. It was everywhere. Yeah. And there was great teachers everywhere. There was amazing yeah. teachers on every corner. And um, so, but around about, I want to say like between 2000 and, and 2004 and a little later, 2008, it seemed like it was just going crazy here in the States. Yeah. I don't know if I'm making a correct assumption or observation that it seems like it's stabilized. I don't want to say yeah. it's gotten less popular, but it just feels like it, it's at a stable place. What, what is yeah. your, what do you think? You know, um, that's my perception too, but I think just like you, I have to kind of, uh, draw that back a bit because I'm not in living in San Francisco, yeah. but yeah, that's also yeah. my sense. And if we look at, the kind of influx of Eastern traditions into the American context and their kind of arc of popularity and then uh, kind of dwindling down into an integration to society. Maybe it's followed that pattern that, you know, karate did and Kung Fu, you know, back in the seventies, you know, mm. they came in strong and now you can still, I can drive around Dallas and I can see karate studios. I can see, you know, I, I guess I haven't seen Kung Fu in a while, but yeah. I definitely see martial arts studios almost everywhere. It's just become a part of the culture, not one that's so celebrated on the front of magazine covers anymore. Yeah. But you're right. Yeah, that's kind of my, what, what you say is kind of my sense too. It's like there was just this frenzy in the early 2000s and uh, it continued for quite a while. It might have continued, you know, you know, clear into two fifteen or so, and but then it started to kind of just become part of the web of culture, and not so much that we make something that we make a big deal out of anymore. It's not that yeah. unique yeah. or yeah. exotic. It's lost its exotic edge, which kind of seems like a necessary evolution, evolutionary track, almost like that's mm -hmm. that's a natural. It seems like a natural progression. Like nothing yeah. just constantly seems like the most new and fascinating thing ever uh, at some point. So I guess it could be to our benefit that it's hitting some sort of stabilization and or integration mode where uh, it it's it's here. Would you agree or what are your thoughts on the fact that I am the fact that I'm even aware of yoga and I know there's these ideas that yoga we could say is based on your differentiation between kundalini yoga, which might be a human phenomenon, no matter what time space continuum we're in versus, yeah. you know, the study of it having some sort of origin or, and, or, um, a lot of text coming out of India that we have access to that it has like a history of 5,000 years. Is that a number? Like that's the number we always hear like yoga is 5,000 years old. It, yeah. Is that in your studies? What what would you? How would you base that number? What do you think is an accurate um, way of explaining that or talking about it? Yeah, I mean, uh, scholars differ on this. I mean, the the key evidence is the evidence is the the Pashtapati seals and the small terracotta um, sculptures from the Indus Sarasvati civilization that goes back. 3,000 years before the birth of Christ. So if you, if you peg the origins of yoga to those 
archaeological discoveries, yoga is 5,000 years old. And I, I'm comfortable saying that because mm-hmm. I think that evidence is quite conclusive. And I could, I could talk a blue streak as to why I believe that to be true. Um, a lot of scholars, you know, I feel nitpick. Uh, they they, they, they um, resist seeing the forest for the trees and they'll, they'll say, oh, that, you know, the Pashupati seal is just then the set of seals they find about six of these things um, are just, oh, it's just a king sitting on a throne or yada, yada. But it's, if you pick apart the iconography of that image in a careful way, there's just way too many things that point to yoga mm-hmm. practice for it to just be, you know, coincidence or, or I think some other cultural form. So, mm-hmm. and because of the stability of Indian culture and because of what we know about the other kind of religious forms of the IS culture or um, in Sarasvati culture, we can probably guess that they were probably doing yoga. Yes. And, and there's also evidence in the Vedas. The Vedas go back, you know, 1,200 years before the birth of Christ, and there's a lot of evidence in there that points to yoga practices. They're not exclusively called yoga, and it's not necessarily Kundalini Vidya, but um, they're are groups of individuals, uh, pratyas and kesins and um, munis and whatnot that are doing a lot of things that look a heck of a lot like yoga. So. Nice. Great answer. And I guess with that being said, I think that if we had this huge you know, popularization here in our culture and if there is some sort of like stabilization and or like integration process happening where, you know, like you said, maybe it's not like the most, you know, cover of every single magazine that we're hearing about. Do you think it's safe to say, and I know we're not trying to predict the future here, that yoga probably will be around forever and ever. Like, I don't think it's something that will be like a jazzercise or a um, physical fitness fad, uh, a Peloton bike, uh nothing against Peloton, but you know, like, um, that it, that it will be around forever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think I, I, I'd agree with that perception. I think you're right. It's going to be around forever in relation. And it's partly because of its history, you know, it has yeah. a lot of cultural momentum. Do you sometimes, I have had a chance to take a course with Guer Guerstein and, uh, he had a, he has an 800 hour, online distance course that took me a couple of years to get through that gave me a good really kind of put me to the study plan and you know reading and writing and focusing on trying to learn the history and mm-hmm. I'm I'm curious if what your perception is of your readings of his work are you a fan do you have critique what are your thoughts yeah um I mean your steam is kind of the first popular yoga scholar. I mean, he did a lot of great work, you know, real early on and published some texts that, you know, are still sellers today. Um, He was kind of the best source at the time, Um, but he's been pretty profoundly transcended uh, by people in the Hatha Yoga Project, uh, Jim Mallinson, Daniela Balakwava, and uh, Mark Singleton, and um, these guys who got four million dollars from the European Research Council to maybe it was five million. Um, did I say five million four five million, four million to, you know, pull up all these ancient texts and and uh, find the new recensions of them that hadn't been looked at before, research all these old Indian libraries, visit sites in India, draw scholars together, write new critical editions of old Indian texts and figure out the very exact um, progression of Hatha Yoga's history from about the year 1000 to the present day. So, I mean, that happens in every, you know, every scientific endeavor, you know, every, every research area is transcended by the following generations of research. So, uh, Fierstein was, you know, for his time, he was unique. There was really nobody out there. There was no scholar in the popular sphere who was spreading the knowledge from deep study to everyday readers, but he did that work. Mm. Um, but he, he's, he's since been transcended by others. Can you give me an idea of maybe something that I would have learned from Feuerstein that's been transcended? Like, a something that the light's been shine on that, that, oh, wow, we didn't, we didn't see that. Or what is an example of that? Is there something that comes to mind? Yeah, I probably could have tracked that more carefully like five years ago. <laughs> 
I know it's um, a random was, question. This super while, needle in a haystack question. <laughs> What's that? I know it's a very like needle in a haystack question specific, yeah, but yeah. I, I just, or, or I guess more, more broad. What, yeah, I what think, is it? An, an I idea? think the yeah. break with piercing has been made, but at that time, five or six years ago, there was some um, criticism of his work that was more specific that my mind's not grabbing hold of right now. No problem. Um, I yeah. think some of his suggestions around shamanism being the roots of yoga, um, uh, didn't have much grounding. In fact, they were more speculation. Mm. Mm. The first thing that comes to mind, there was a few other points that were a bit critical, um, but I'm having a hard time sourcing them right now. What What are your thoughts with the connection of shamanism and yoga? Because that is an idea that I've always heard and thought a logical progression. You know, that, yeah. what, what do, where do you stand on that? Well, shamanism per se has a different geographical purview than yoga. It's more something that's been practiced in Northern Asia. It's something you find in Mongolia. It's something you find in Tibet. Um, I've actually been in those contexts and experienced it firsthand a little bit. Um, and it, and it's very much, it's a nature religion. It's a little bit like the Wiccan traditions of Europe. It's, it's, it's sourced in, it's a little bit like voodoo. It's a little bit, Worst in like magical views of the world and the manipulation of primal forces, uh, natural forces, animal spirits, and whatnot. Um, and there's some of that in yoga, but yoga, and I know this is going to sound a little contradictory to what I was saying earlier, is is much more scientific. It's really it's really much more anthropomorphic. It's much more interested in looking at the body and figuring out how to manipulate the body in very specific ways. Um, and even though it might take the name of an animal for a given pose, that early on in my study, I, I suspected that that came from some more animistic, mm. you know, tradition, understanding of how the body works. But since then, I've kind of abandoned that idea. And that's, that would be a primary link to shamanism. Is it like, you know, if we're trying to imitate the energy of an eagle in eagle pose, you know, that's a very shamanistic concept, but that's not really my sense so much anymore that, that there was a uh, animistic conversation going on in the Hindu tradition. Um, it's really, we don't find it. We really don't find it in yeah. the, that kind of shamanistic yeah. Yeah. worldview. That's I mean, partly because it was just more organized. You had more <laughs> yeah. people. You had you had more of a city culture. I mean, that's the strange thing that people don't realize is that yoga, even though we claim it's natural, it grew out of a civic context. It grew out of a dialogue in the Mahajanapadas in the early cities of the second urbanization in India that, that where people were actually in contradistinction to the civilizing forces. It's not something that came up. I mean... Shamanism comes up in a in a pastoral context. It comes up in an agrarian context. It doesn't grow up in a civic context. Mm. So that's partly the difference. And when you're in a civic context, it's much more intellectually driven. It's not so much this, you know, spiritual incantational seance, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. intuitional response to the world. It's a much more intellectual response to the world, even though it's not our sense of modern science. And you're saying Sidhik. S i d h a h h i. No, civic, civic, S c i v i. Ah, I'm so yeah, sorry. Civic. At first, yeah, I thought you were saying like a, a city, like the Sidhis, and then that's why yeah. I wanted to differentiate in a civic culture that yeah. makes more sense. I totally understand yeah. now. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So, and what is your idea? Like you mentioned, say eagle pose, and when I first got into yoga, I figured, well, someone probably looked at an eagle and they looked, they made this posture and then they thought, yeah, let's name it an eagle. Like it, yeah. maybe it looks like a beak or maybe it's like the wings yeah. coming up and wrapping around. And, um, and then obviously we have, you know, stories of Garuda and in relation to like maybe the Ramayana and or yeah. different folkloric texts and or yeah. Mahabharata. Do you, what are your thoughts in relation to the connection of the stories such as Mahabharata yeah. and the yoga posture names? 
Yeah, I, I think it's that simple. I yeah. think it's just a facsimile. It's just yeah. cow's face pose. It looks like a cow's face. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. not. It's not that we're trying to take on the consciousness of a cow. <laughs> I mean, not that that's not a bad thing, but it, it's not. It's not an express part of the yoga practice. Because the yoga history and philosophy world is so enormous. I mean, yeah. just enormous. And I really can't wait to read your book because you would kind of need 2,000 tweets or statements to like yeah. to start to encompass it. And I love the fact that you made mention like the way with your parents and your upbringing that when you said, now I'm this, they, they didn't flinch, you know, they're like, cool, you know, explore yeah. that. Where do you gravitate toward now when there's such rich diversity between, you know, theistic traditions, atheistic traditions, and the breadth of philosophy that comes out of India? Is there a sp- specific branch and or book and or part of it that you're drawn to more than another? Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm still a Christian. You know, I, I believe Jesus's revelation is unique. If nothing else, it's unique to my cultural experience, you know, my Protestant uh, Euro-American experience, even though you know, it comes from a different part of the world. Yeah. Um, and my culture is organized around it. I mean, it can, you know, it, it definitely is a secular culture, but the, the, I can talk all day about how our secular values are rooted in a Christian tradition. I mean, it's, if you look at it at all closely, it's apparent. So, I mean, it's a bedrock source for our understanding of the world, the way we've shaped our understanding of the world in the West, and which has now pretty much become modern culture worldwide. Mm-hmm. Um, so Christianity is important to me, both at a personal, you know, uh, in personal level and an objective level. Um, but then Hinduism is too. I mean, um, I feel it's pretentious to say it, <laughs> but I do really feel like a Hindu Christian. I, I've spent lots of time in India. I've obviously spent a lot of time studying the Hindu traditions. I, 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 uh, I find myself in those cultures often and feel very at home in them. It, the richness of the Hindu tradition, the way it embraces all things, and really, really, because its knowledge base um, integrates all things. It doesn't have an argument with modern science. It doesn't really have an argument for any other religious system because its worldview is so deep and so inclusive that it makes sense of other traditions. It really does, to me, seem mm. like the palimpsest for world culture. It, it It is the root understanding, and it's not because everything came from India, but just because India did that subjective work, you had these people for thousands of years sitting around in meditative meditative states, figuring this stuff out and what they learned is bedrock. I mean, the West, I studied the Western tradition of philosophy before I encountered Hinduism and it just seemed to jumble. Like one guy says this, one guy says that it doesn't make any sense. But if you understand the the world from the Hindu point of view, it does make sense Mm -hmm. because they're all lending a deep reality from a kind of a colored point of view of the view that's in the on the periphery but if you look at the the you know the, the nature of reality from the hindu worldview it all makes sense and i'm you know i'm an intellectual guy it's got to make rational sense to me um so even christianity i pretty much explain in terms of hinduism mm. i do i do explain it because <laughs> it makes sense that way that's otherwise odd. it's just a jump it's a, just a jumble of contradictory myths if you were to attend a service, say near where you live in Texas and or, yeah. any, or anywhere in, in the country and or world, and you meet someone that also shares the same belief as you uh, uh, of Christianity and, and love for Christianity, and but then they get really uh, upset that yeah. you are open to studying and and learning about these other traditions. How do you navigate that in a way that you obviously respect their space and aren't trying to push anything on them? Do you have a way of rationalizing and or um, discussing with them to help um, see the connection of all these different traditions as opposed to just the differences? Um, God knows I've tried. um, (laughs) uh, You know... (laughs) 
<laughs> I live in Dallas, Texas, and I and I and I meet people here that I've never met in my whole life. Types of people I've never met in my whole life. I mean, devout Christians who really hold to that worldview. You know, um, uh, what's the proper word for it? They're they're really not curious. They're not intellectually curious. I mean, often because they're good-hearted people, they will. I'll meet such people and we'll have a nice heart connection and they'll want to learn about my worldview, but I can tell it makes them intensely uncomfortable. Mm. It particularly makes them intensely uncomfortable because I've got it worked out rationally. So they really can't oppose it on logical grounds. And, um, these discussions will evolve openly at first and then just end. Um, mm. and you know, I respect Christianity deeply. I respect all of its forms. Um, I do believe in open mindedness as well as open heartedness. And that's in my path. I know that you can live within a more provincial worldview and you're fine. You know, you don't, you don't have, nobody has to travel the whole world and see everything. It's not, people aren't disposed that way. They're content to be in their kind of tribal consciousness and they're happy. And sometimes, you know, those things, those tribal consciousness contribute an immense amount Mm -hmm. to the larger conversation and I respect their devotion, their their good works, um, uh, and and part of the way I explain it, I enjoy in explaining it from the from the modern yoga point of view is you know you study with Patabi Joyce and you know probably that he said one of his famous quotes is one guru is life, two gurus is death. Yep. Yep. And these people have chosen Jesus as their only guru. Yep. And that's just fine. Yep. Good point. And to help clarify for the listener, well, how can two gurus be death? Can you elaborate on the complications that can occur when you're listening to two different sources of information? Yeah. So it's a polarizing statement, obviously. I mean, one that doesn't embrace cosmopolitan. <laughs> in no way whatsoever <laughs> um, and, and, and the danger there is that you can explain any of your predilections and not make any progress in the mm-hmm. past you can justify whatever your primal urges demand not give up anything not narrow your focus because if you embrace a number of worldviews, you can always find some justification for something that your id or your libido or your ego wanted to do anyway. Yeah. Good answer. Perfect answer, Eric. That was awesome. On that note, ego and libido, what are your thoughts on the, the rise and the fall, the, a lot of these teachers have been put in a spotlight and have risen to guru status. And then the realization that humanity is pervasive and everyone, and therefore they're human. We're human. We make a quote mistake and then, you know, we fall. Does that seem like that's obviously this is on every culture, tradition, whether I I know we look at yoga and or religious traditions and we hold them on high because we think like they need to serve as example. And therefore that's how we build our trust and faith and because they live by example, not just through their words. And then we have that like uh, realization that that's been, you know, that crumbles. And it seems like in the last few years, there's been a lot of that. I don't know if it's just my perspective, if it's because of the internet and the amount of information I have access to. Maybe it's been this way all along, (laughs) or maybe it was more because of, say, a Me Too movement or a a raise, uh, elevation of consciousness in terms of equality, male, female, race, color, creed, economics. But um, what are your thoughts regarding... um, this idea, I don't know if I really pinned down a specific question. I, okay, let me make it more specific. 
Um, do you feel like there's been a rise of realization of all these different yogis and gurus who really just love to have sex with everybody and or take advantage of that and now it's kind of coming to light and um, was the tradition more open to that in the old days and now we're in this very civic tradition that, not civic, <laughs> sorry, civic yeah, tradition yeah. where, you know, now that's not okay. You know, yeah. and what what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I think all those things are true. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, yeah. It's, and, it, I mean, there's just yeah. a few things we might yeah. add to it. Is that, you know, male gurus didn't teach female students in the pre-modern era. Mm. You know, they, they weren't tempted. That's interesting. They were teaching other males, you know, and yeah. they weren't homosexual communities. Yeah. Um, so you didn't have that and you didn't have the abandonment of oversight that came when an Indian guru was able to strut his stuff as an exotic figure with his own set of rules mm. in an American context and therefore he all of a sudden was subject to new temptations that he had to never face before. And it's usually a he, of course, and cope with and get under control. And there was no guidelines for him. We can think of any number of gurus to put in the name of that him um, from his traditional context to help him in this new, in this mm. new setting with yeah. new dangers. Interesting. And there is a, there's been a fail. There's been a fail in the interface at the guru level between that, again, I'm going to use that fancy word pedagogy, that style of teaching in the Indian context where, you know, maybe it worked, you know, we, we don't have the Me Too movement to go back to that era or, you know, the free press or whatever it was that's exposed all these um, oversights, mistakes, uh, abuses. Um, my guess is it did work in that context. I could be wrong. But it doesn't work in this context. Mm. I mean, I think it's been proven. And I also think that the culture is moving forward. There's new ways, new forms of personal growth that are much more transparent, that are actually healthier, mm. that um, we've learned, you know, in the past 50 years. And those guys were before that, before the curve. Yeah. Great insight. I like that perspective. That, that that maintains some level of kind of humanity and understanding that things are changing and shifting and evolving and uh, that we can actually improve. Yeah. On that note, I what you're doing in terms of creating you're studying, you've you've studied and are and are studying. You are you know, really involved in yoga and have been for a long time. You've compiled your understanding into the form of a book and making it available for me and other listeners and yogis and people to read. So you're contributing to the yoga, evolution of yoga. What is your kind of dream if you, if you could define and or do you ever dream about what you'd like to see evolve in our culture? Like, I think what you're doing is really amazing because you did make mention at the beginning of our conversation that a lot of yoga, that, that the yoga that we're uh, aware of in our culture here in America has gotten increasingly more body orientated and maybe a little less phil philosophy and or uh, interested in some of the subtler aspects that is your dream goal to kind of bring this rich context of yoga out into the open more and make it more readily available and, or do you have anything to add to, to that? That's my own vision of your, yeah. that's my vision of your dream. I don't know if that's appropriate for yeah. me to, to lay it out like that, but what do you, what do you think along those lines? Yeah, I think that always has been, um, I've always been really, interested in enriching the world's understanding of yoga. Um, I think I really set myself up as that in that position really early on in my career. I wanted to be kind of the scholar who could 
translate the deep stuff to the popular awareness, to the layman's awareness. Mm. Nice. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Any and, you know, it just, it just dismay me to take yoga classes here in Dallas and see so much monoculture and to see it so shallow. Mm. Um, and I, and I don't know where that, how that happened. It seemed like, if anything, it would have gone in the other direction. Um, mm. And I don't know if that's just a function of the city I'm living in. But, uh, yeah. That's a good point. Yeah, because you would think from natural evolutionary <laughs> uh, perspective that it would be around longer, so then more yoga practitioners would be more interested in the philosophy and therefore yeah. there'd be more discourse about yeah. these traditions and it would that and would enrich it. But yeah. the first thing you said when you said monoculture, it makes me think of, say, modern agriculture in terms of like a... Um, just the monoculture of just plants, you know, we drive and we just see this yeah. one plant and we see 20 chemicals to make sure that nothing can get to that plant. So it grows. And yeah. as opposed to like a, a permaculture or an, an organic garden where, you know, everything is feeding something else and benefiting something yeah. else. And there's this really diverse environment created. So maybe it's just a, maybe that's a reflection of our, almost our agricultural systems. You know, and there's uh-huh. probably, there's probably other things too that are reflective of, yeah, of this, like just narrowing in on one thing and then just, just yeah. staying on that and not. <sighs> yeah. And I wonder how much it is a function of this new conformity, mm. which is kind of settled in on American, you know, in American political conversations that you have to be in one camp or another and mm. you don't let your mind wander and go free and embrace opposing concepts. And maybe that's become a part of the yoga world, at least in Dallas. I mean, I can just go to so many classes and I'm no matter who the teacher is, they're saying the exact same thing and they're doing the exact same pose sequences. And it's like, Jesus Christ, do you have any idea how rich this culture is? And you're going to have me do this pose again. (laughs) You know, it's like, I, I know that, you know, there's some animus in my voice and it's, I, I do take this kind of personally. It's like, Jesus Christ. I mean, I'm, I'm obviously kind of upset. Um, so yeah, it's, it's kind of strange. And, and is it a function of that part of our culture? You know, everybody's tribalizing and opposing one another and it's my way or the highway or my tribe's way or the highway. I, I, that's my best guess. It's, yeah. Or it's just yeah. a lack of intellectual curiosity or I, I, I don't know. Yeah. Great observation. Well, oh, I am so thankful to have this opportunity to talk to you, Eric, because I think these convers like this conversation for me personally is so interesting and I love your viewpoint and I love every, I loved, I've enjoyed everything that you've had to say. I want to keep going longer and I know we both budgeted about an hour to hang out yeah, and chat yeah. together. And I really want to continue this conversation. I want to read your book and come back with some questions that are uh, educated based off your what you've what you've compiled. I'm super curious now. So thank you so much for taking yeah. time to speak with me today. And is there would you be open to doing this again in the future? That's my first question. Yeah, I really enjoyed talking to you, Seth. Thank you. On that note, is there something that you would like to close with for us today in relation to anything else you would like to add? Yeah, um, just in light of our last comment, um, and I and I, I know I've said this before in, in other points, um, so people who you know followed me, you know, don't be bored, but I, I just feel like the, the reason you, you study the deep tradition is to be creative. If you want to create something that has a lasting effect, study the deep tradition, tradition and then evolve it from a deep place so that you enrich further generations. Nice. That you offer something that's deeply sourced, something that... Um, makes sense, makes new sense of what's gone before. That's why we study the tradition. I mean, it's also fascinating and fun, and it's it's cool to fill out the picture of the past and to hear stories and whatnot. 
But as far as a functional activity for those of you out there who are actually teaching, study the tradition so that when you, you know you can start to trust your intuition in a deep way. And when you discover a new pose or a new way of doing a pose or a new way of doing a breathing technique that's related to a pose or in something in and of itself, that it makes sense because it's consistent with what's been learned before and goes beyond it. Wow. That, that we're all, we're all the carrier, we're the living carriers of this tradition and we have the potential to have as much knowledge as anybody who's gone before us. And then we get the joy of creating something that will last. Nice. Oh yeah. Thank you, Eric. Yeah. I'm inspired. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> I need some new creativity in my life. <laughs> Yeah, that's the fun part. Oh, man. Well, I'm so excited to get a chance to cross paths with you, and <clears throat> I will do my homework, and I'm going to call you back, and we're going to schedule, uh, hopefully we can schedule a new, another time, and I really want to continue this conversation. So once again, uh, thank you so much. Yeah, I look forward to it, Todd. All right, thank you. Bye-bye. Right, have a great day. Okay. You too. Native Yoga Toddcast is produced by myself. The theme music is dreamed up by Bryce Allen. If you like this show, let me know. If there's room for improvement, I want to hear that too. We are curious to know what you think and what you want more of, what I can improve. And if you have ideas for future guests or topics, please send us your thoughts to info at Native Yoga Center. You can find us at nativeyogacenter.com. And hey, if you did like this episode, share it with your friends, rate it and review, and join us next time. 